Blackbeard, Blind of the Seas. Today on Echoes Through Time, we are going to uncover the intense life of the man known as Blackbeard, the most famous pirate in history. One of the most interesting books to delve into the world of piracy is A General History of the Robberies and Murders of the Most Notorious Pirates. Published in 1724 and written by Charles Johnson, a pseudonym believed to possibly conceal Daniel Defoe, the author of the novel Robinson Crusoe. That book, being almost contemporary to the pirates it talks about, greatly influenced popular ideas about piracy. His name was Edward Teach, although it can also be found as Edward Thatch. In those times, it was very common for pirates to modify their surnames to protect their family's reputation. Not much is known about his early life, but according to most experts, he was born in 1680 in a port city called Bristol, England. Bristol at that time was an important international port, thanks to the growing Atlantic slave trade. In fact, it was the second most important city in the country. By the late 17th century, Teach traveled to the Caribbean aboard some commercial ship, possibly a slave ship. For a time, he was a sailor operating in the Caribbean, specifically from Jamaica, on Corsair ships during Queen Anne's War. This war, which began in 1702, pitted the supporters of Archduke Charles of Austria, supported by the English, against Philip of Bourbon, supported by the French. It was the War of the Spanish Succession, fought in North American territories. The war was won by Philip of Bourbon, who would become King Philip V of Spain. Now let's talk about Corsairs. They were sailors who only in times of war had letters of mark meaning a license to carry out acts of piracy against ships of certain nations. In other words, each Corsair ship worked with the backing of a nation, which granted them permission to loot ships from rival nations. And in the case of Teach, as a Corsair, he participated in the attacks on French and Spanish ships. But when France and England signed the end of the war in 1713, all ships destined for these naval attacks found themselves without the opportunity to legally assault ships, so they continued their activity illegally. During the war, these ships had acquired crews skilled in naval combat and boarding, and the ships were perfectly prepared for this purpose. Nothing was going to stop them. However, something would continue to be the same. Most pirate ships did not attack allied nations during the war. Moreover, those countries did not put much effort into preventing commercial ships of enemy nations during the war from being assaulted. They considered it as a naval reserve fleet in case the conflict restarted. During his privateering years, Teach stood out for his bravery and determination, traits that would distinguish him as a pirate later on. During Queen Anne's War, the island of New Providence in the Bahamas was raided several times in 1706 by the Franco-Spaniards, causing almost all Englishmen to flee the island. But it was eventually taken over by pirates, establishing a base of operations in the Caribbean, a strategic location on the maritime routes of European ships crossing the Atlantic. Thus, the Pirate Republic was born, which was never a formal state but was self-governed through its own code of conduct. Two prominent captains, rivals to each other, led the Pirate Republic from its inception, Benjamin Hornigold and Henry Jennings. After Queen Anne's War in 1716, Edward Teach joined Hornigold's crew as second in command. Hornigold soon entrusted Teach to lead a captured sloop. In 1717, both pirates, each with their own ship, raided together thanks to Hornigold's ranger, the best armed in the region. In September 1717, they met Steed Bonnet in Nassau, a landowner and military officer from a wealthy family, with very little naval experience who had turned to piracy. Bonnet's crew was dissatisfied with his leadership, so Teach took control of his ship, the Revenge, while Bonnet recovered from injuries sustained in a previous boarding. The fleet now consisted of three ships, Teach's Revenge, Teach's former sloop, and Hornigold's ranger. They captured another sloop in October, and continued to successfully raid. 
Hornigold preferred to let English ships pass without attacking them, which irritated his lieutenants, and ultimately, after a vote, he lost command and left with the ranger. Teach, now in command of the Revenge and another sloop, desired to capture larger ships. His luck changed when he spotted and captured the French frigate Concord near the island of St. Vincent on November 28, 1717. He renamed the frigate Queen Anne's Revenge and handed over the smaller sloop to the French crew and let them go. Under the command of Queen Anne's Revenge, Teach plundered relentlessly along the coasts of Africa and the Caribbean. On December 5, 1717, he captured the ship Margaret near Anguilla, earning him the nickname Blackbeard. Subsequent descriptions portray him as a tall, lean man with a braided beard, dressed in dark attire with knee-high boots and a wide-brimmed hat, occasionally accompanied by a long coat of bright colors. In battle, Blackbeard carried three pairs of pistols, hanging in holsters like bandoliers, and tucked slow matches under his hat to smolder around his face and give him a fiercer appearance to his enemies. However, despite his purported ferocity, there are no verified accounts of Blackbeard ever harming any prisoners. It's possible that this supposed theatrical detail in combat was just another ploy to enhance the pirates' greatest weapon, the fear they instilled. As Blackbeard well knew, the more feared he was, the less blood he needed to shed. Reputation was paramount for a pirate captain. That's why each one had their own flag. For example, if a merchant ship recognized the flag of a pirate ship and knew that this pirate was infamous for executing the crews of ships that had attempted to defend themselves against boarding, it was much more likely to surrender without a fight. The darker the legend, whether true or not, the easier the job became. And newspapers of the time aided in this task by publishing stories, like the one claiming he had shot his first mate, stating that if he didn't shoot one or two crew members occasionally, they would forget who he was. In May 1718, Blackbeard, leading a fleet of four ships, was at the height of his power. So confident was he in his abilities that he blockaded the port of Charlestown in the English colony of South Carolina for over a week, halting and plundering all ships attempting to enter or leave the city. After that action, Blackbeard's fleet headed north along the coast and entered Beaufort Inlet in North Carolina with the intention of careening their ships there. However, Queen Anne's revenge ran aground on a sandbar and another of his ships in attempting to free it also ran aground. Many historians and some of Blackbeard's crew believe that the famous pirate intentionally ran those two ships aground to reduce the size of his crew and thereby increase his own share of the accumulated loot. Deliberately or not, Blackbeard stripped three of the ships of all their treasures, abandoned most of his crew, and with his remaining ship, sailed to Bath, then considered the capital of North Carolina to enjoy his spoils. In 1718, the Pirate Republic, which had lasted for 12 years, came to an end when the governor of the Bahamas, Woods Rogers, a former corsair, regained British control over Nassau after offering the king's pardon to all pirates who surrendered and renounced at further crimes. One of those who accepted the royal pardon was Hornigold, whom Rogers entrusted with the mission of becoming a pirate hunter and capturing those who had not accepted the pardon. The king's pardon offered immunity for any crimes committed before January 5th. But Blackbeard had blockaded Charlestown in May, so theoretically, it wouldn't have helped him. However, colonial governors could grant their own pardons, and the governor of North Carolina, Charles Eden, granted one to Blackbeard. It seems that the governor and the pirate had a very good relationship. Many accused Eden of receiving a share of Blackbeard's loot. According to Charles Johnson's book, Blackbeard tried to integrate into Bath society, attending dinners and social gatherings, where guests saw him as an exotic curiosity. He even married the daughter of a local plantation owner. But there is no historical record to prove it. In any case, he didn't take long to return to piracy. 
In August, he set sail with his only ship, the Adventure, and captured two French ships. He put the crews of both ships on one vessel and returned to a Krakoke with the other. He had become a pirate again, violating the terms of the pardon. But Blackbeard claimed he had found the abandoned ship at sea. A vice admiralty court was quickly convened, which ruled that indeed, the ship had been abandoned at sea. Interestingly, the president of that tribunal, Tobias Knight, kept 20 barrels of sugar from the ship's cargo, and Governor Eden took 60. The rest of the ship's cargo went to Blackbeard and his crew. One or two months later, in September or October of 1718, the feared Captain Charles Bain and his crew of 90 pirates sailed to Bath with the aim of recruiting Blackbeard to attack Nassau in revenge for the persecution Hornigold subjected them to. Although Blackbeard rejected the offer, he and Bain threw a grand party in Ocracoak. It is said that the revelry lasted for days, and other renowned pirates, such as Calico Jack, joined in. Then Bain left, and Blackbeard never saw him again. But news of that pirate party spread like wildfire, and the governor of Pennsylvania, concerned, sent to sloops to capture the pirates. They were unsuccessful, but the governor of Virginia, Alexander Spotswood, was also uneasy, because he sensed that the governor of North Carolina was doing nothing to control the pirates, who posed a risk to Virginia's naval trade. So he personally funded a mission to capture Blackbeard, perhaps hoping to lay his hands on the fabulous treasures that, as rumored, the famous pirate had hidden. Although there are different versions of how Blackbeard's life ended, this is the one that historians consider closest to the truth. The mission led by Lieutenant Robert Maynard included two ships, the HMS Pearl with 30 crew members and the HMS Lime with 25, along with two sloops, the Ranger and the Jane. Meanwhile, Blackbeard remained aboard the Adventure with 19 men. When sighted, Maynard's fleet approached the pirates at dusk on November 21st with the intention of attacking the next morning. After several situations, in which even the ships were stranded for some time and the need to use oars at times. As the lieutenant anticipated, as soon as both ships were close together, Blackbeard ordered the boarding, and when the pirates headed towards the stern, encouraged by the fact that they outnumbered their opponents by far, the rest of Maynard's men emerged from the hold where they had been hiding, shouting and firing. During the battle, Blackbeard managed to break Maynard's sword with his cutlass, and Maynard stepped back to try to draw a pistol. But when Blackbeard charged at him, one of Maynard's men delivered a lethal cut to his neck with his sword. After Blackbeard's death, his men surrendered. According to some sources, when Maynard examined Blackbeard's corpse, he discovered that he had received five bullet wounds and 20 cuts in the combat. He also found a letter from Tobias Knight on him. Yes, the president of the tribunal that had judged him shortly before. Maynard decapitated him, threw the body into the sea, and hung Blackbeard's head from the bowsprit of his sloop, ready to claim the reward offered for it, which was 400 pounds sterling, equivalent to about $90,000 today. Upon returning to Virginia, Teach's head was placed on a pole at the entrance to Chesapeake Bay as a warning to other pirates, and it remained there for several years. And what became of Blackbeard's supposed treasure? For centuries, treasure hunters have tried to find it, but nothing found in the numerous sites explored along the eastern coast of the United States has been linked to Blackbeard. In fact, the notion that pirates buried their treasures is a modern myth. On pirate ships, the crew shared the loot, and if a captain had tried to bury treasure to hide it, his own men would likely have turned against him. The only treasure recovered so far from Blackbeard's exploits are the objects found among the remains of what is presumed to have been the Queen Anne's Revenge, which were discovered on November 21, 1996.